normally Top Gear tests new cars. And on the face of it, that's what we've got here, right? A 2023 Aston Martin DBS 770 Ultimate. But really, this is not the future of Aston Martin. This is its past. This is what it's leaving behind. What we've got here is, well, not just the last DBS, but very possibly the last Aston Martin to have a socking great V12 engine up there doing the business behind the headlights. So, yeah, welcome not so much to a new car as to a long goodbye. Now, there's absolutely nothing original about a car company churning out a special edition to help sell off some of the old stock, usually right before a new car comes along. And on the face of it, that's exactly what Aston Martin's up to here. Ye old DBS gets a dollop more power, and then you'll forget all about it straight away, because there's the new DB12, then there'll be the Valhalla hybrid supercar, and well, if the Red Bulls do us Formula 1 fans a favour and crash into each other, then Fernando Alonso might well earn Aston Martin its first ever Formula 1 victory this year. But don't just think that this is, you know, Aston Martin finding some roast beef and Yorkshire pudding in the factory freezer, reheating it and pretending it's a Michelin star meal. No, this is not just one of those special editions that's old leftovers. This is the most powerful fastest and actually very possibly the best front-engined Aston of all time. Right, I've pulled over because it takes far too much of my limited mental capacity to drive a 770 horsepower canal boat along and explain to you all the details. So let's have a stop and let's have a look around. There's lots and lots of details on this car, which are rather delectable. And the first one, I have to head into here, if you'll excuse me, and pop a giant clamshell bonnet. This is all carbon fiber, but for the ultimate, you have this huge mono nostril and the extra vents, because of course, there's a lot of heat escaping from this villain of an engine. Still 5.2 litres V12, but more turbo pressure. You get 45 more horsepower, so it's up to 759 of the King's brake horsepower or 770 metric horsepower, but no more torque because if it went higher than 664 foot-pounds, then the eight-speed automatic gearbox, which lives at the back, balance out this massive engine's weight. Well, that would probably just implode. There's also more bracing Beyond this that you can see on top, there's more bracing underneath just to stiffen the DBS up. It is actually quite a long car after all, so that should have handling benefits. There's other bits we'll talk about later as we're going along, but wow, what an engine bay that is. I mean, yeah, it's gonna be traction limited off the line, isn't it? Nought to 60 is gonna be a three point something seconds. It will do 200 miles an hour, but this is not a numbers car. This is a details car, so there's, different aero and carbon fiber here. There's another sort of side skirt lip poking out there, but my favorite detail, wow, has to be these, the 21 inch sort of Spider-Man edition wheels. They're just so intricate. We first saw this kind of design, I think it's an option on the Valkyrie and then the Victor one off that we drove uh, last year. That has something similar as well, but they are just wonderful wouldn't want to volunteer to clean them. Definitely think it's a high treason offence to curb them. You probably get thrown in the Tower of London, but worth the 315 grand asking price? Hmm, you be the judge. Now, speaking of all the carbon fibre, because this car does have all the carbon fibre, I want to show you something in here, something I'm not sure about. You see, if you buy a DBS Ultimate, you can get these carbon shell bucket seats. Now, if you know anything about sports cars, if you've maybe been in an old sports car before, you'll know that over time, the driver's side seat bolster will collapse from years and years of people flopping down onto it. So, apply right leg, extend, flex, and ow! Bang your head on the roof, and then this thing just bites the underside of your thigh. It's excruciating. I mean, can you hear that? Can you hear how rock hard that is in your sort of svelte super gt it is 
brutal. That is car designed by S&M. Anyway, I know you're not feeling sorry for me, so uh, shall we? Now it takes no imagination whatsoever to add more power to a car. And if anything, it's actually the last thing that the DBS needed. But actually what the Ultimate really is, is a collection of everything that Aston Martin has learned about producing this car over the past five years. And it's downloaded and distilled them all into this car, but then all those lessons will then reappear in the next one, in the new DB12. And what are those lessons? Well, it's just tweaks and sharpening that take this from being kind of a lazy Super GT into something that's a bit more of a brute. So they've been busy tweaking just about everything that moves. There's stiffened up steering mounts. Aston's had another go at the power steering calibration. They fiddled with the ride settings and there's the aero tweaks. It doesn't sound like night and day stuff on paper. You would have to be a real upper echelon car geek to spot an ultimate edition. Actually, you've got to be really, really lucky to spot one because only 300 coupes will ever exist along with 199 Volante drop tops. And guess what? They're all sold. But if you were to look up more than the sum of its parts in a dictionary, you might well find one of these. I mean, yes, it's got a dollop more power, but the actual interesting thing about that is that at last the DBS feels like it can use all of its power and torque. The way that the gearbox has been refined, the tweaks to the suspension, just no longer has that sense of being a slightly wayward dragster. Don't get me wrong, this is not a supercar that happens to have a really big boot and useless back seats. This is still very much a continent-eating GT car that will set a land speed record if you ask it to. It's kind of the other side of that coin. But that's fine. I mean, I've got another car in front of me right now, and I'm on a really great road. And if I was in a Ferrari 812, I'd be flash the lights, ah, avanti, get out of the way. Come on, I want to be at 8,500 RPM with that savage engine. But the thing with the Aston is, it also rewards you when you aren't using all of it because it's so beautifully damped. It is unfathomably comfortable for a car with hard shell carbon seats and massive wheels. It works so well on a terrible British road. And ultimately that matters, doesn't it? In a car with seven, 800 horsepower, you're never gonna be getting up the top end of it all the time. So how rewarding, how gratifying is it that in this car, you feel just as special and just as pleased with yourself to lope along, feeling, well, far more suave than I have any right to. Obviously, the DBS can't hide its age or Aston Martin's limited budget absolutely everywhere. And that really shows inside. This interior has aged faster than a newspaper and doesn't have any right to be in a car costing over 300 grand. All of the touch sensitive buttons down here are a complete nightmare to try and hit and it's all very reflective. The transmission buttons that are laid out and four in a row just doesn't work. It's not helpful, especially when you're maneuvering and absolutely everyone is looking at you. Uh, what else? I cannot forgive Aston Martin for the screen up here with the revs and the speedo and the temperatures and what have you. It just looks so cheap and nasty. Um, and then, yeah, the infotainment. If you've got a 10 year old Merc, congratulations. You share quite a lot of your interior with the top of the range Aston Martin. And I, I don't like touchscreens. I'm a big fan of having a click wheel, but there is no getting away from the fact that you basically have to blow the cobwebs off that system every time you use it. Then there's no glove box. The only storage really is a motorized cubby hole down here, which is a bit silly. I mean, there is room for my lunch, but not a lot else. And um, yeah, I've got my 
cable for my phone, but it's completely pointless because I plugged it in earlier and it turns out that this system isn't wired up for Apple CarPlay, which the last time I checked, you get a standard on a 15 grand Dacia. You know, this thing literally is James Bond with wheels, isn't it? The DBS, it's devilishly handsome. It packs a massive punch and on the inside, it's full of serious, unresolved issues. Aston Martin's probably going to... Sorry, hang on. <laughs> like I was saying, Aston Martin's probably going to change out of all recognition over the next couple of years, isn't it? I mean, all that Lawrence Stroll money. We're going to need to start coming up with some rewards soon. They want to be a Formula One superpower beyond the Valkyrie, there'll be the Valhalla. And at the other end, well, they want probably another SUV. And at some point they're gonna to have to go electric. I just hope they can bottle some of whatever it is that makes this TBS so gratifying and keep it for the future generations. Because for me, this, this is what an Aston Martin looks like. This is how one behaves. Too much beauty too much power, basically a kind of second world war fighter aircraft with the wings chopped off. Massive engine, glassy cockpit, absolute exquisite looks. That is an Aston, right? How are they gonna translate that into the future? I don't know, but this is a really, really great way for this era, if you like, just to head off into the sunset might well be the best Aston Martin I've ever driven. Quite excited for the DB12 now.